thank you so much for coming. <laughs> um, we um, made this um, little gathering because we are a group who are working on setting up a bigger scale lab next year in Oslo. Um, that will take place in open space and involve an audience. Um, so this is uh, partly um, discussing the challenges and advantages of that, uh, what happens when we do that, and um, a general interest in the concept. We have very different backgrounds. My background is in architecture. I only started lobbying like two years ago. Um, but have been working with urban space and art in urban space and street games. Um, Thibaut, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Thibaut. Uh, I have a background in theatre and literature um, and then transitioned to sort of interactive designs, um, kind of gamey. Um, yeah. hmm. I am Martin and uh, I have a background in political <laughs> science, <laughs> but I work as a LARP maker uh, and uh, usually it's uh, more educational LARPs, uh, but uh, occasionally I get a chance to work with LARPs which is uh, more about, which can be designed more without any specific commission. So I'm very uh, looking very much forward to being part of working on this. And then we also have Karete, yes. who's not here today, or yet. Yeah. Um, no, she's just fun. No, 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 no she's <laughs> fun. I know. Uh, <laughs> just have been very fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karete is uh, in, in not professionally. She works as a psychologist, but she also works a lot with Alibia on various uh, lab projects, and is a, a lab maker who, yeah, have, I don't know really what to. I have made quite a few laughs with her, at least. We, we decided to start with a little presentation of a project called The Underworld. And uh, the reason for doing that is that it is uh, one example of, uh, of uh, a LARP, or at least LARP, uh, a performance with partly LARP elements uh, with uh, an audience, and that also has, uh, it was not done in an urban space, uh, but it's still done in a quite large space. Uh, and some of the mechanics uh, are things that we think can be helpful as kind of mental hooks for you, maybe, when we are talking more about uh, LARPs in urban spaces later. So the underworld was built on the idea of different places where you go when you are dead. There are descriptions of underworlds in most religions and most mythologies, and they are different, but they also have quite a few things in common. So this was a project that we uh, were four or five people who did together. It's not responding. No. It was made by uh, two lab makers, who uh, was Kareta and me, and three storytellers, who was uh, uh, called Ilva Sjostal, Lisa Grimnes, and Torgrim Mellem Stene. And it was done in a collaboration with Oslo Storytelling Festival. We wanted to try to combine storytelling uh, and uh, LARPs. And storytelling is a format that can have many different forms. Some people just sit in a chair and, and tell a story, but there are also storytellers who use uh, more uh, dramatic elements, uh, so it's more similar to a theatre performance. In addition, we invited in more storytellers and some lab makers and some other people to be part of this uh, performance. So what we did was that we created a frame and then we put uh, small other performances or pieces inside it. Yes. So very, uh, what we did very basically was that we tried to make a LARP where you, as a, uh, if you bought a ticket to this event, you were taken into a room where you, you had different hours where you were supposed to come there. Every half an hour we let in new people. First you got some, uh, uh, some pre-workshop, I will say a little bit more about that. A short workshop where you were given a character and a little bit of information. And then you enter the underworld. You could stay in the underworld as long as you wanted before you decided at some point to leave the underworld. 
your character would then be reborn and you would go through an exit uh, ritual. So inside of the underworld, we had different uh, posts or stations. So uh, I will show you some more pictures soon, but as a, a participant or audience member here, you can, you can go in and you walk around just as you want and maybe you can uh, sit down and listen to a story here. Maybe you can uh, play some games over here. Uh, or in this area, maybe you can uh, you can meet some creatures and uh, and interact with them. The different you can also play along with some scenography and uh, and other objects in in different parts there. But uh, we had a, I don't know exactly the number, but we had a number of different uh, stations where we had either performance uh, performance storytellers or larpers doing different things. Uh, so, how did we enter the people into this? First, when they arrived, we gave them headphones and asked them to sit down. On the headphones, they got some basic instructions and also uh, some uh, music, some sounds to kind of set the mood for this. When the instructions were finished, the mood and the music continued so that until they were ready to go in, they had this, we tried to kind of get them uh, slowly out of the real world and into the atmosphere we wanted them to have. We also used this to tell a little bit about the basic rules, such as uh, to not be violent in the underworld, for example. Then they came into a room where we had a short workshop. We had new audience coming all the time, so we didn't have much time for this. I think we had 20 minutes with them. They created a character. It was someone who was dead, but they had some fragments of memory from who they were before they died, uh, and a little bit of motivation, and a little bit of training them on how to behave in the underworld once again. And then the ferryman came and entered them into the scenography. The ferryman is quite famous from, uh, from, an, uh, from underworlds, the one who takes you over the river and then into the uh, country or the kingdom of the dead. So what could you do here in the underworld? You could explore it walk around and find objects, play with them. You could interact at least on some of the stations. And you could also sit down and listen. At uh, the end of each story, uh, it was also always given a kind of a dilemma. Uh, what would you choose if you had to sacrifice your lover to save the world? that kind of dilemmas. Uh, would you do it or not? Would you save your lover or save the world? Or uh, if, if you, if you yeah, that kind of questions, which are can be quite hard. But, uh, uh, and then you were given a little token based on your answer. And these tokens were used in the final part of it when you were sorted. Uh, and then uh, you were given a little feather based on the, based on your decisions you were sorted into a house based on a different on different animals so for example the house of the wolf or the house of the elephant house of the whatever animal and you were given a feather with different colors so that in the bar afterwards when you were meeting the other players you could see ah you have a you have the same color as me who are you or or you have a different one yes and uh, we can so the rest of the presentation I have now is, is mostly pictures, but I'll try to just describe a little bit more. So you, you walk around. <coughs> this part of the underworld was a LARP made by Nina uh, Assendrop, that some of you know. It's uh, called The Fragile Life of Souls Gone Missing. So here we had LARPers in character, and they were meeting audience in a way. They were also having characters, but they were in a different fiction. So there is a fiction inside the fiction. Um, and this is one of the storytellers. He was uh, he had this table which uh, looks. Uh, we can just go through them. Uh, I will tell a bit more. This is the uh, the death. You can play games with him, dice, and different games. Here is some of the storytellers uh, playing. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just different parts of the scenography. Nina Asendop again. And uh, this, uh, I think, is Oslo, one of the other organizers of State of the LARP. We had a little forest in here. We had some trees. That uh, is not something I would recommend you to, to do, to bring trees into the black box, unless you have a lot of uh, 
uh, big cars and experience with carrying trees. <laughs> but it was very nice when we managed. Uh, around his table here is a, a kind of um, engaging a lot with the, with the audience and uh, they, they are allowed to kind of influence the story. So some of the storytellers had uh, many elements of interaction while others uh, did not. This table is also a classic from the underworld. It, it looks quite nice uh, at a glance, but if you look closer, there are small worms in the food. There are, uh, these are like uh, a heart and a liver from a human. And uh, so it's a lot of nasty stuff. So it's, it, but it, at first glance, you think this is a very nice dinner table. Yeah, I think, uh, that's basically uh, what I have the time to say. Um, we did it, uh, I think, a bit more than 100 people were through there. And uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, I don't know if I should say so much more. I think most of them had fun. But it <laughs> was at least it got very crowded in the underworld towards the end because people were taking much longer to become reborn than we had expected. <laughs> All right. I guess I take over then. Uh, it could be the start of presentations will be very different, at least the slides. Um, so I want to talk a bit about dimensions of or what I call dimension of audience. Um, it's kind of all right, considered to be sort of toolbox um, to tackle the the idea of an audience from different perspectives. Um, but before I dive into this, so let's quickly. Um, go into the question, what is an audience? Um, like a very practical example, you in this very moment are somewhat an audience to uh, us presenting, of course. And uh, here's a little Wikipedia uh, definition of what an audience is. So an audience is a group of people who participate in a show or an encounter of a work of art, literature, theater, music, video games, or academics in any medium. Audience members participate in different ways, in different kinds of arts. Some events invite over audience participation, others allowing only modest clapping and criticism and reception. So this is very general, and as you can see, LARP is not in there. So Wikipedia has not considered LARP to be a thing with audience, and uh, we're here to change that a little bit. So the first one is, is the audience experience in the LARP mediated or unmediated? So this means, is the audience present or not? Like you are present right now, um, but physically, physically, yes, uh, not mentally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you might also. I hope you are also <laughs> mentally present, uh, but this is not what it's meant here. Um, and if it's mediated, of course, the the um, audience is physically absent. Um, and then, of course, the question arises: What is the medium? Is it some sort of stream? Uh, is it social media? Um, I think you know what I mean. Right. Um, the next one is what I call distance. Um, so from what distance does the audience experience the LARP? Um, uh, the A here stands for audience. Um, and I've worked with these three terms, zoom 2, zoom 1, zoom 0. Um, this is just uh, a model. So um, zoom 2 would be like from above like metaphorically speaking from above, big overview of what's going on. Um, and ideally the audience experiences everything that there is. Um, this, like the closest you would get, for example, in theater is you sit in a chair and you see the whole stage and there's only one thing going on at the same time, or there's only one thing going on, so you can really focus your attention on it. Um, but even on a stage, um, there might be different things going on and you will never see everything. So um, that's why I put it almost there. But this is the intent that you get an overview of everything. Then if you zoom in a little bit more, um, this would be zoom one where you experience only parts of what's going on. Um, but you still get a bigger picture. And the last one is like super close close-up um, where your experience is highly fragmented um, and maybe you don't even realize what the bigger picture is. Might be also a state of confusion um, that can be interesting and so on and so forth. So this is what I mean by distance. Um, the next is time. Um, we had this that uh, some labs take longer than others, so one day or maybe five days or even more. 
Um, so the question is there, how much does the audience actually see of the, the runtime of the LARP? Should it see the whole thing? Should it see only a certain part, a certain frame? Um, the next one is space. So um, what space is available to the audience and how free is it to move in it? So um, I think this is also very interesting follow up. Um, so do I have access to the whole space? Um, is there some limitations on the space? Are there some uh, restrictions? Like is there some part of the audience that might enter certain um, areas and other parts of the audience may not? Um, and also the question of mobility. Um, in theatre you usually sit in, in, in one chair and that's it, that's your fixed position. Um, that might also be applied to, to LARP. Um, can you move but you're guided, like you're not allowed to move freely but somebody takes you by the hand or something. Or the most free version would be the free roam through a space. Um, the effect <coughs> so how much can the audience affect the LARP? This is also the question of interaction. Um, so the first one being not at all. Um, second one I call punctual. So you can trigger certain interactions. That's maybe also what was part of the underworld. Um, so you would go somewhere and this would evoke a certain interaction, uh, um, a story. Um, the next one I call partial occlusion. So um, for a certain amount of time, you may take up a role in, in a LARP, in a scene. Um, or the, the last one, full inclusion, that you kind of transition from being an audience into being a LARPer. Um, yeah. And the last one I have here as a slide is stability. Um, so how stable is your audience? So stable either as a group or in knowledge. So if you um, imagine you have an audience that or all of your audience has gone through the same workshops, you can assume they all have the same knowledge. So in this respect, they're stable. It's a stable audience. Um, but um, we'll come to this later with urban space. Um, you might have people who do not know what's going on. Um, and then you have to address this audience a bit differently. Um, or you have a mix of both. Um, yeah. So, um, those, those are all kind of dimensions how to think of audience and um, depending on what audience you want to address you have to take different actions and come up with different designs. Um, just as a short overview now, um, yeah, that I'll give over to you. Okay. No, yes. That's this one. Go to the next slide please. Um, yeah, so this is one of the very first uh, games I made out in um, space. It was a very guided tour um, through the streets of Zurich and back then and to some extent still my um, motto was reality depends on what you are willing to imagine and allow. Um, I think you can take the next. Um, yeah, so this is a very long quote um, about immersive. Um, it's from a book called Beyond the Immersive Theatre by Adam Alston, um, where he talks about the experience machines. And I find this quote to be interesting because it talks about how the audience members uh, are placed in an environment um, where the resources, uh, the sensors, the imaginative and explorative capabilities as productive and involving aspects of theatre aesthetics and he asked, is the experience machine preferable to the most more difficult pursuit of desire in everyday life as an autonomous, autonomous individual? Um, and for me, the interesting thing is exactly this clash of what happens when we take our means from theatre, from, from our imaginations and put out into the city, when we start playing in the city. Um, how does it, um, obviously there's a cliche of looking at the city as a stage and you're saying like 
the human is always, how is the quote again? Uh, the uh, performative uh, human, the theater quote. Anyway. Um, um, yeah, so we are always performing something. Um, when we're out in the city, we are performing um, d an expected behavior most of the time, and what happens when we interrupt it. So, next one. Um, again, a, a rather long quote, but the background for questioning um, the urban spaces um, is often um, concerned less with representing political issues than to intervening with urban space. It's to question um, and to create new meanings, experiences, understandings, relationships, and situations. Um, I feel like I'm ranting here. Uh, <laughs> um, but what I want to get at is that whatever we do in the public space um, is political to some extent. We have to think about what we put out there um, and we will always interrupt the city when we go out in the city um, or we play along uh, but our presence means something um, or as someone posted in State of the Lab, next one please, um, posts the link to this Twitter feed also where she says, if you don't put your politics into your games, you are inadvertently putting someone else's. Um, and I think it's important to think about that what, when we go outside the theatre room, we are uh, giving out an even m broader um, impact and message, and we have to be aware of that. Um, last time I talked about this, someone said, well, I just want to have fun. Isn't that enough? Um, and say, yeah, but that's also a statement. Why do you want to have fun in the city? Having fun in the city, is it because you're not having fun enough? You don't feel like there's room for you in the city uh, to have fun? Um, so for me, that's also a valid political argument to say, I just want to have fun. Next one. Um, when I work in urban space, I look at any given space this way. What is the potential and uh, how can we look at the urban space of what it consists of? Um, there's the uh, actors, so that would be the people who are invested in the room, uh, in the space. It would be the people who own the place. Is it a private or publicly owned place? the people who use it, the neighbors, the visitors, the planners, and pol uh, but also politicians and activists who might not be there, but they have an interest in the place. Um, then there's the site itself. There's spatial conditions. That would be the weather, the s what kind of ground do we have, uh, what are the sounds, um, the architecture, uh, housing, again, um, yeah, trees, um, and also the history of the place it might be like statues or um, what kind of um, physical things are there. And um, the third would be the knowledge of the space, that what is in people's head, um, the immaterial history, something happened, there might don't be any trace of it anymore, but something happened there um, and everyone knows or some people <coughs> know. There's a theory um, about what this place is supposed to offer. Um, there's politics, ideas of what are coming next, um, um, or what it could possibly be. And ideally, that would end out in the, the legal framework, where society is the material and the actors are the social. And all this informs what happens when we play in urban space. Um, how to choose where to play, um, what kind of ideas are we messing with, or like where are we playing, what are we playing with, and obviously who are we playing with, um, and um, how can all this come together. Um, next one. 
And obviously all of this is informed by the culture, the norms, traditions, fashions, cultural protocols, I guess that's why you're laughing, and the social control of a space. And with cultural protocols, uh, I mean the uh, ingrained behaviors uh, that we perform and act in public space that we might not question, usually. Um, the way we expect it to, to act. Um, side note, me and Tibo have a project that tries to disrupt that, called Cultural Protocols. Um, next one. So traditionally, you can also look at how to make an invitation to the, a new engagement with urban space. You can start these three different places. Um, you can make new material, urban interventions. You can build new furniture, um, or you can clear up um, uh, access to a place that then, in, in the end, enables a new social use and can mean that um, you have to legally change uh, what is happening there. You can always change the laws of what is uh, possible a place in any given space and hope that the people are catching on and then act differently. Or you can socially invite for a different use of a space without um, uh, necessarily changing the legal or the material first. Um, and that goes with mostly art and play. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples of that recently is how hipsters suddenly take over bridges and start sitting on bridges. And that's like, how did that happen? People just started using a place differently. They didn't change anything but their behavior. Uh, but that have meant that uh, actually uh, municipalities and stuff have had to change the legal aspects. Um, I think that's interesting in the way of how uh, a behavior can start a movement or s change the city and who owns a different, a different uh, places and the appropriation of it. Next. Um, why was I taking that twice? Don't remember. Sure, next. Yes. Oh, so that's the uh, exercise <coughs> to go back. <laughs> um, yeah. Any questions from to any three of us, I would say, now, shortly? Maka? Um, uh, can you open the uh, picture with the Zoom model? Oh. Yeah. So I can just see. Yeah. This is this one. I'm going to do the bad thing where my question is more of a comment. That's good. <laughs> no, but um, um, the thing that I reacted to or started mm. thinking about uh, when I saw this was maybe mostly the Zoom 2 level. Uh, where uh, you talk about the audience, or you said ideally maybe I understood, uh, misunderstood you there, but the way I took it, when you talked about ideally the audience should see everything, mm. see the whole lot, uh, as it's going on. And for me, I think that's like that entrance to it is something that diminishes uh, what LARP is. Uh, to me, the thing about LARP as a cultural practice, and um, like also as an art form, is that it makes it so visible that it's as many stories about what took place and s as many experiences about what took place, uh, because everyone is inherently there as a participant. And I don't think that's just true for LARP. I think that's true for all performance art. But it's sort of obfuscated. Uh, in the way performance traditionally is conducted because uh, that's something that belongs to the performance artist and it belongs to the ones who get to tell the story afterwards. Uh, and, and in LARP, 
it's, it's very often if you try to define a LARP afterwards, like what happened and what it was, people will have a strong reaction to that because they know that's not true for them. Uh, and I think like if you put something on the Zoom 2 level, I imagine you run the risk of taking that away and then you lose something about, about what LARP is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, I still think it's it's important to think about this, especially if you want to include audience that is not familiar with LARP, because what you um, com if coming from another background also like I've, I've I have a lot of experience with theater, also with different kinds of audience in theater as well. But still, like the classical, I would say the classical audience member is somebody who really wants to see everything, um, and that um, there was there was one one. Um, I can't remember the name of the the piece, but anyways, it was um, I think it was by the director of Martala in, in in Berlin at Volksbühne, and um, part of what um, what some um, uh, actors on stage said was not um, hearable. They were behind some wall, and they were you could hear them talk, um, but you could not hear what they were saying. And people got w were raging afterwards. We couldn't hear them. Like we, we couldn't hear them, although this might be part of it. And so there's this notion of, um, I want to get everything. So audience members that come from another place and do not know about this, what makes LARP maybe so special that it can also be super detailed and you never know really what's going on. It's really focus based and so on and so forth. You kind of have to address this also, that this might be the scope that people approach LARP. I agree with this, and I think also as a model, this is certainly something you have to think about. But I think maybe also we as, as LARPers need to be more critical of this ourselves in terms of how we think about documentation. Mm. Definitely. And I, yeah. I, this for me, this is not like something that has to be ingrained always, but mm. it's something, it's a scale from the old fashioned theater where you sit and you get the whole experience and you get one message to the highly fragmented complete confusion I, I and and just like a notion of the spectrum and maybe that most normal people from the outside world when they go to something they expect that and we should be aware of that beforehand that somehow maybe that have to be addressed in the pre-workshop that you should not expect to be able to hear what the audience say or some that kind of I think it's more clear to me also how you mm. use the word ideally. So, um, um, I have a, a question. Yeah. Um, is there a distinction between LARP being LARPers that are playing and they have a character and audience that do they have a, a role like inside the story or they just watch? For me, that would also depend on the different games and the right. setups. Um, and it's and I think that's an interesting spectrum of how you can go from being an audience member to a player <coughs> and what's the spectrum there and how do you make, as a designer, how do you make the invitation? Mm -hmm. And how are you mediating all these different um, points of view and like challenges? And that's also what we would go into uh, now. Um, of how that uh, how we can make the audience part of a lab um, and um, and explore the audience experiences now. <laughs>